waiting for the stage to shake and vibrate like it did in the first gathering. It kind of scared me. I thought, okay, God is showing up here. <laughs> well, good morning, New Hope. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Bud Stanton. I'm one of the elders here at New Hope. And as always, it's my honor and privilege to share with you today. Uh, this is week three of our five-week uh, journey through that 25-verse letter that's the book of Jude. And just because it's small, it really is. I mean, you get through it pretty quick. Uh, and it's the second to last book of the Bible. It really doesn't diminish its weight or importance. And we're going to look through a section of scripture in that today, a few verses that, um, uh, that Jude, the author of this letter, the brother of James, as we learned, who's the brother of Jesus, our Lord, he, he tells us his entire reason for writing this. And, and that's what that intro video and our series graphic are all about, that, that fight for truth. And, and I just love that video. And, and with Rob, I, I love this image of just preparing for that battle, preparing for that fight. And, and so as we get ready to study today, it's so important. Even though Jude wanted to write to us about something else, and we learned that, he was so compelled by the Spirit of God, he completely changed direction. And he changed direction, and, and he told us something different. And, and we see that right up front in the third verse. We see these words. It says, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. See, as people of the book, a book that many times points and encourages us to peace and path, pacifism, right? It teaches us peace. He says, you know, beat your weapons into plowshares. And, and what does Jesus tell us? He says, you know, if somebody strikes you on one cheek, what are we supposed to do? Turn the other cheek. But you know what? There are times and places and reasons and things that we really need to fight for and we should fight for. Our faith. What is true. What's clear and agreed upon. We should fight for others to see Jesus. We should fight against our own internal battle and our own internal struggle to kind of go the other way. We should really fight our real enemy and his darkness in this world. See, and that's great. But what's Jude specifically urging these Christians to fight against? What's he really telling them? And in verse 4 it says this, For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They've kind of snuck their way in. And what he's telling us is these are bad guys. Okay? These are secretly coming inside you, and we've got to be aware of them. We have to be warned of them because their thoughts and their beliefs are impacting us negatively. They're infecting and influencing us. As a matter of fact, they're perverting and twisting the word and the grace of God into a license to sin. Have you ever heard the phrase or even used the phrase, I know I have, I'm just a sinner saved by grace? Right? And that's true. Absolutely is true. I'm a sinner saved by God's grace. But does that give me the license then to do whatever I want? Because scripture, what does, remember, uh, if you don't know the story, Jesus, the, the, the Pharisees caught this woman in adultery and they wanted to stone her to death. And Jesus came along and said, okay, go ahead and accuse her, but the first of you without sin, go ahead and do that. And they all walked away, right? And he asked her, where, where are your accusers? She said, they're gone. He said, neither do I accuse you. But the key, what does he say after that? Go and sin no more. God's grace doesn't give us a license. He wants us to live differently. And as Pastor Rob told us last week, most of this letter is about describing exactly what these opponents look like. Past, present, and future. He taught us last week about past opponents, and today I want to talk to you about present opponents. And then next week, Pastor Rob is going to share about future opponents. But present opponents... So a couple of thoughts uh, about today's journey. One, we're going to see what the actual present opponents of the faith at the time of Jude, what they look like, and discover Jude's best advice on how do we fight them, how do we successfully battle against them, and see a different picture of what their way of life leads to. 
But secondly, as Rob and I met a number of times and, and studied this passage, and as I studied it on my own, it really spoke to me and impacted my life. See, many times we read scripture and we just, we kind of, it's a short letter, I'll read through it. Oh, I can check that off. I read the book of Jude. But when we really sit down and study and, and read God's word, it can have a major impact on our life, and it should. And this, this, this six verses we're going to look at today just really impacted me in a new and heavy way. And my prayer today is that God will bless you in the same way. So listen to these words about present opponents. Jude 8 through 13 says, In the very same way, on the strength of their dreams, these ungodly people pollute their own bodies. So just listen as I read these. They reject authority and heap abuse on celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to contempt, condemn him for slander, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Yet these people slander whatever they do not understand, and the very things they do understand by instinct, as irrational animals do, will destroy them. Woe to them! They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. These people are blemishes at your love feasts, eating with you without the slightest qualm, shepherds who feed only themselves. They are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit, and uprooted, twice dead. They are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shame, wandering stars for whom blackest darkness has been reserved forever. We're going to walk through this because there's a lot in there. There's a lot of weight and a lot for us to see in here. But before we do, let's pray. Father, as we walk through these six verses today, I pray that you would give us a crystal clear picture of the kinds of people the church was facing at the time Jude wrote these words. I also ask you would give us wisdom and insight into these same issues facing the church today. Finally, I ask that you would protect us and keep us. Help us to fight with and for you, never against you. In the name of Jesus, amen. So three questions as we walk through this portion of Jude today. First one is, what do our opponents look like? To, for any fight, you got to know what your opponent looks like, right? you got to see what they are. But wait a minute, Bud, didn't you, you just said our opponents. Weren't we talking about when Jude was writing this letter? And the opponents that were facing the church then? Yes. But I challenge you today as we look at these six verses to ask yourself, does this sound like people and problems from a long time ago? Or does it feel more current and relevant than that? After all, here's how this passage begins. In the very same way, in the very same way, on the strength of their dreams, these ungodly people pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and heap abuse on celestial beings. So consider those first words. In the very same way. In the very same way. See, last ro week, Rob taught us about the sexual immorality of Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay? That was from the past. But this week, we read about people who pollute their own bodies. Again, another, because God tells us sex outside of the body or sin outside of the body is sin, but sin inside the body, sexual immorality, we pollute our bodies with those, that type of sin. So this was also a reference to sexual immorality. Last week we saw our Israelites who make that entire journey of the Exodus and then decide not to believe. They're through that whole thing and get towards that end and turn away. And this week we have people who reject authority. So what did Scripture say? They reject authority, God's and anyone else's. And then we get this even fuller picture of what these people are like and how they behave. It continues, yet these people slander whatever they do not understand. And the very things they do understand by instinct, as irrational animals do, will destroy them. See, if they don't understand it, they slander it. They speak against it. They speak badly about it. They mutter and murmur in text. 
Oh, wait, did they have texts back then? <laughs> they text to those who will agree or who they can influence. We look for those people who will agree with us. You know, I'm not doing this. We've never done that before. I don't agree. I've been a part of the church leadership here for a long time. And I want to tell you, at least about our elders and our pastor, we seek to hear from God. And we proceed in faith. And not once in the years that I've been journeying with these men, not once have I seen even a glimpse of power-hungry control. Because it's not about us. It's about God. And frequently, though, I see people who oppose what they don't understand. See, it's hard to hear from God. But you know what's even harder? Is when we don't work and move together. And we oppose one another. So these people are doing. But see, it goes further than that. Because they don't just oppose what they don't understand. See, there are things that they feel are true and they believe. And they're firm in that. And they're going to stand with it. And they have instincts about it. Now guys, <laughs> you're probably all going to want to take my man card away from me after I say this. And ladies, you'll appreciate it, I think. Um... But in the 26 years of my marriage with my wife, there's been a few times where I said, I'm right. That's it. I'm, I know she is absolutely wrong. I'm not giving in on this. I don't care if i got to sleep on the couch. I'm right. You ever been there, guys? Come on. Am I the only one confessing truth today? Come on. Really? Really? I have ladies raise hands for the guys. I don't care. Truth, right? just to come and find out that I was wrong. I had an instinct. I had a feeling. I knew I was right. I've been blessed. God blessed me with a, a very gracious wife because she just says, kiss me now. That's her way of saying you were wrong. Just kiss me. Tell me again. You know? But see, the, the Bible here tells us this is not about discernment or godly intuition but more like the instincts of an animal. Isn't that what it said? Which are not good instincts. But in fact, what did it say? It says, when followed, it tells us, we'll destroy them. Many times in my marriage, where I knew I was right, that I was right, that I was right, that could have destroyed things. And so could it be that this type of person has always existed, as we heard about past opponents, and will always exist as we learn today about present opponents, and as Rob will speak to us next week about future opponents, do we know any people like this? Do any of us have these tendencies sometimes? See, Jude is compelled by God to urge us to fight these things to the death. They're not this, oh, it's no big deal. We've all said that. Or that's just the way they are. But these things will lead to death. So that's more about what these opponents of the faith look like. Now, let's see how we're going to fight them. And Jude tells us how to do that. Our second question is, how do we successfully fight them? So how do we go about this battle? See, this is what Rob mentioned last week when he said, this week had Jude's best answer to how I can fight for my faith. And I'm telling you, see, I've known for a few weeks that I'd be here this morning and so sitting here last week and Rob said, next week's going to be the greatest message. Thanks, brother. No pressure there, right? Okay. I reminded him that later. But. So he left me to be the one to share it with you. But you know what? That's okay. Because it's awesome and it's powerful. And it's not powerful because of Rob and I. It's powerful because of God. So watch how this passage continues. And I love this, because this, this, this was the kind of the aha moment for me. See, it says, but even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, and for me that was, huh? So if you're like me at all, you, you have wondered, when did they have this fight? 
Well, I've read the Bible. I don't remember this. Oh, wow. Michael was fighting with the devil about the body of Moses. That just struck me. But as I continued to read, it was the next thought that really hit me. And it was actually, it was more fun to actually think about and consider. It's what would I do if I was the archangel? You know what archangel just means? What Michael was? The archangel is, is the definition is the angel of the highest rank. Michael was in charge of all the heavenly host, of God's angel armies. So picture this warrior standing there with the sword, okay? Picture him, not me. Picture him. But I'm thinking, okay, what if I were, I command God's armies. If I was fighting the devil, and you know what? Maybe some of you don't fight because you don't think you have the strength or feel like you have the strength. But Michael sure did, right? The angel of the highest rank commanded all of God's armies. I'm thinking, this is a bad dude right here. And what did he do? He did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said what? Read it with me. The Lord rebuke you. So remember, these people had slipped into the church. They slandered what they didn't understand. But Michael, the archangel of heaven, refuses to touch that stuff. He doesn't go near it. He's fighting with the devil. And what does he say? The Lord rebuke you. So what can we learn from this? Have you ever heard the saying, or maybe you've said it, I, I know I have, I, again, another, a lot of confession in this passage as I read through it. Have you ever heard the saying that, you know, God is my co-pilot? Jesus is my co-pilot? See, too often I believe our lives and our faith look something like this. The company I work for, our, our national headquarters is in Mansfield, Ohio, and we have another facility in Indianapolis. And uh, I would, about once a quarter, I would go over and do training with our, with our accounts and with our staff there and spend about a week there. And I just, I remember I always prayed for myself for safe travel, um, and I always prayed for my family. But as I read through this passage, I thought about my prayer. And, and as I thought about this, because my prayer sounded something like this. Lord, thank you for who you are. Please protect me in my travels. And, and please watch over my family while I'm gone. While I'm gone? As if I had control while I was here. And while I'm gone, I want God to look after them. And then when I get back, I'll take the wheel again. Okay? So I appreciate your help, God. I appreciate your assistance. See, the idea of God as our co-pilot, having him on board, ready to assist, sounds great, right? Man, I'd love to have God on my side, assist me and help me. But you know what? God is not our co-pilot. As a matter of fact, I think he's a pretty bad co-pilot. God doesn't want to ride shotgun with us, okay? And he's not our assistant. See, when we live that way, here's what eventually always happens. Can you read that license plate? It says, God is my co-pilot. I don't the irony. See, the problem is that for too many people, even people of faith, we're looking for God's assistance. We're looking for God to ride shotgun instead of inviting God to be God. See, and even if the Archangel Michael, so I've given you a picture of this dude, right? Even if the Archangel Michael refused to fight and accuse the devil himself, but only in the name of the Lord, how much more should that be true for you and I? Because no matter what you guys see stand here, I'm no Archangel. So how much more true should this be for us? So what's the practical part? Great question, I'm glad you asked. See, the practical part is don't fight what you want. Only what God says and what he asks. Fight for what he asks. Because when you fight and you do it in God's name, with God's power, guess what? He sustains us. 
Because if we do it in our own power, what ultimately happens? Kind of like that car. Because I know I've done it in my own power. I've tried to do it in my own strength. And I've failed. Anyone been there before? Anyone there now, maybe? But see, when we fight in God's name and his power, the battles he wants us to fight, he sustains us. So our final question is, what happens when we live like this? What happens when you and I live this way? See, when people did it in the ancient past, what happened? When people did it when Jude was writing this letter, what happened? What happens today if you and I take this path? Well, the passage continues. Woe to them. We'll talk a little bit about that word, woe. <laughs> they have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. Woe, a stop, a yell, a command, right? You're going to step off a cliff, my friend. Stop. Whoa. You're going to run out into traffic. Got to get your attention. And I remember as a child, um, and, and I think these moments, those woe moments when somebody, God gets your attention, you remember them. And I remember being uh, little. I was two, three, or four years old. I mean, I was little. And you think, well, bud, how do you remember that far back? I'm not that old. Those, these moments you remember, they're embedded in your mind. And I remember I was with my grandparents, and we were at my, my great uncle's house, my grandmother's brother, and we were out in the yard. And the reason I remember that is because my little butt started down towards the road. And I remember distinctly hearing my grandfather say, Stop! I stopped. And he grabbed me and pulled me back from the road, just as the car went by. Now, back then, we had a thing that was called, and I remember this distinctly, called a butt whooping. <laughs> I don't think we see many of those today. But my grandfather proceeded to give me a butt whooping. He got my attention and said, there are consequences for that action. You could have been hurt. You could have been killed. See, there were consequences. It, it tells us they, they took the way of Cain. And if you don't know, Cain was one of the first sons of Adam, right? Cain and Abel, first sons of Adam and Eve. And what did Cain do? He killed Abel. He killed his brother. Why? Out of jealousy. And then it says, they ran into, for profit, Balaam's heir. Now, okay, you're probably like me. I read that. I'm like, who's Balaam? I said, I think I've heard that before. So I, I went in and I dug in and I said, okay, who is Balaam? Well, Balaam was a prophet of God. He was hearing directly from God. And he got hooked up with this Moabite king named Balak. And Balak tried to convince him to, to curse the people of Israel because he wanted to overthrow them. And Balaam tried three times to curse the people of Israel, unsuccessfully, because God didn't allow him to do it. But see, King Balak had offered Balaam a reward a financial advance if Balaam would do this for him. And Balaam wanted it. So he found a back door to slide in there and help King Moab overthrow the Israelites because he was greedy and he rejected God. And, and it says later on that he was riding the donkey out of town and there was this big angel standing in the road with a sword. And go and read the story sometime for yourself. Okay, Balaam's error. And then it said Korah's rebellion. Okay, and I confess there's another name. I didn't know who Korah was. I admit, if you guys know, that's awesome. So I went and I researched. I said, okay, who was Korah? Well, Korah was part of the whole exodus with Moses and God leading his people out of Egypt and out of slavery. And at one point, Korah decided, wait a minute, I'm as smart as Moses is. Matter of fact, I think I'm better than Moses is. He's, he's misleading God's people. He's misleading us. So you know what? I think I'm just going to I'm gonna raise up some other folks that think like me, and we're just going to overthrow Moses. See, Korah's problem was he wasn't just setting himself up as being equal to Moses. He was actually trying to set himself up to being equal to God. Because, see, God is the one who called Moses into that position. Moses didn't even want it. 
He said, God, I can't do this. And God says, you're going to be the one to do it. God didn't call Korah. Korah called himself, raised himself up, and led a rebellion against Moses. You know what the outcome of that was? Almost 15,000 Israelites died because of his rebellion and his rejection of God's authority. See, there's three more examples of good people who choose to live like this and risk their lives and the lives of others and the eternities of others in doing this. But let's look at this further description of what happens to anyone who takes this path. These people are blemishes at your love feasts, eating with you without the slightest qualm, shepherds who feed only themselves. So what's he talking about here? What are love feasts? Think about Holy Communion. Think about communion. When we take communion. That is a love feast. That's Christ inviting us to his table to participate. And here are these people in among, they slipped in among the church that are rejecting God's authority, that are setting themselves up above everything else. They're being obstinate and greedy. And their focus is totally off God. They're blemishes in their love feasts. Shepherds who only feed themselves. What's the main purpose of a shepherd? Feed the sheep. Protect the sheep. Care for the sheep. See, and this section ends by giving us four more pictures just like this. So let's read through this. It says, There are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind. Autumn trees without fruit and uprooted, twice dead. There are wild waves of the sea foaming up their shame. Wandering stars for whom blackest darkness has been reserved forever. Can you imagine being created to be a shepherd and never know the joy of feeding your sheep? Or how about being that rain cloud whose sole purpose is to give life-sustaining water to the earth but not having a drop of water in you to do that? Or how about the uh, fruit tree? So only purpose is to bear fruit. But what did it say? At harvest time, there was no fruit. And worse than that, it would never have any fruit because they ripped its roots out of the ground. It was twice dead. Or like a wave who in all our foolishness and shame choose to make a spectacle instead of being humble and contrite. Or a star whose sole purpose is to shine, to shine bright where we find ourselves wrapped and stuck in darkness, never to shine. See, for far too long, I think the church has used unhelpful language like, if you do this or that, God's going to be mad at you, and we wave our fingers. Or, if you do that, you're going to go to hell, you'll end up in hell. But the truth is, God loves you. God loves me. God has a purpose for you and for me. And you may or may not agree with this, but I think there's something much sadder than ending up even in the hottest part of hell. And let me give that to you in the form of a statement or even an offer today. You can fight or you can miss out. You can fight or miss out. Because you see, so many of us are living our lives without ever really scratching the surface of what God's purpose is for us. We just go about our day-to-day thing and we never really know what he has for us and what it means to be who God created us to be. See, you shouldn't fight for the faith or your faith just because you're going to get zapped. My one brother is a non-believer. I've been praying for him for years. We've talked about Jesus and faith and what it means. And, and he's, he's actually read the Bible about three or four times, cover to cover. He's a very smart man. But his whole thing is, my sins are so bad, I don't want to just accept it to get, get into heaven. And I told him, they're right, that's not the reason to do it. So I keep praying for him and I keep talking to him. Because the reason to do it is because we want to be a part of something terrific. Something, the the most incredible thing that's ever happened on this planet. 
And we want to be a part. That's why we fight. And knowing God has a part for you to play. Whatever it is. If you're a shepherd, feed sheep. If you're a cloud, give rain. If you're a tree, bear fruit. If you're a star, shine bright. But don't miss out. Don't slander what you don't understand. Don't think you're part. What were the shepherds? Back then, the shepherds were the lowest of the low. They were dirty. They were smelly. Do you remember King David? What did he start out as? A shepherd. When we find what God's part, purpose is for us, and we live into that, God can do amazing things with us. So, will you fight? Will you fight for your faith? Because I promise you, if you're like me, we're all fighting for something. We're all fighting for something. But for many of us, the problem is it's the wrong thing. And I've done that too. We're fighting for what we want in our own strength and even becoming those people who oppose God. Because when we fight for what we want in our own strength, that's not what God wants. And I promise you, if you haven't yet, you will, because I've been there and done that. You do it in your own strength, without God, you will fail. But hear me on this, church. And I think this is probably the most important part. Please hear me. This is not about guilt. It's not about me trying to guilt you or God trying to guilt you. That's not what it's about. This is about an opportunity. Because, see, whatever you're fighting today, whatever that battle is, you can change that fight. You can change it today. See, as we fight for God and in his strength, it's always better in every way. You can change your fight. So as we are going to and have this entire series, I'm going to read these last two verses of Jude over you. Just listen to them as they wash over you. And then I'm going to pray them over you. And the band's going to sing them over you, and you can join in at any time. See, this benediction or doxology here at the end of the letter, this is to give those who choose hope. If we choose to fight and contend for what God wants, and in his strength, we have hope that he's with us. Fight for what's important to him. Fight his way. And God will be there to help us and sustain us and ultimately give us victory in the end. So hear these closing words and receive hope. Receive God's hope. To who, him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. In the beginning, now, and the time to come, right? That's what it says. Forevermore. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this day. I thank you again for the opportunity to share your word with your church. Lord, uh, my prayer today is that as we've looked at these six verses in Jude and as we continue through this small but powerful letter, that we would choose to fight for the things that you want us to fight for and we would do it in your strength. Lord, that we would not live like your opponents. Lord, that we would not reject your authority that we would choose to fight for our faith through you. That we can be presented before you without fault and with great joy. And Lord, I know that's not just our joy, but that's your joy. That's your pleasure. From now and forever. Amen.